Welcome into this Five Clubs conversation. Our Masters Preview Series continues. Today, the viewpoint of the instructor in building a game plan for Augusta National. The man who's going to join me was just the recipient of the Butch Harmon Award as the number one teacher bestowed upon him by Golf Digest. He was also the 2020 PGA of America Instructor of the Year. Now, he wanted to play for a living, and then he didn't because he was so injured at a young age, and he turned to instruction. And now, Justin Rose, Colin Morikawa, Max Homer, among his clients, all three in the Masters field. How do you build a game plan for Augusta National? We're going to find out right now with Mark Blackburn. Split second, your hands make all the difference. It was time for a grip to help them own the moment. Introducing Reverse Taper, technology to stabilize both hands for a more square putter face at impact. The most important split second in golf. Reverse Taper, only from Golf Pride. Respect the grip. And with that, we welcome in the instructor himself. I mentioned the Butch Herman Award. Uh, I don't know how old you were when you started to aspire to win that because you wanted to play the game. That's got to be humbling, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, it was a great opportunity to meet Butch in Vegas at the Butch Herman Golf School. It was really cool. So, I mean, it's kind of all a bit surreal. I tell everybody, like, you're just trying to coach, do your job. Um, and it's nice to get accolades. And your peers obviously vote on this award and, I'll be the first to say, like, it's named the Butch Harmon Award, which is great. Butch is no longer, like, they put all those guys, like, on the Mount Rushmore of coaching. So if Butch was still on the list of people who could vote for, I'm sure he'd still be the number one coach. So uh, it's so one of those things. It's kind of cool. It's a nice accolade. Uh, nice that your, your peers vote it. But I don't know that it makes you any better as a coach. If anything, it's probably bigger shoes to fill, and it, it probably motivates you to, to continue to learn and get better. Well, you're, you're awfully kind to indulge me. And as I explained to you when I reached out to you, I want, as we do this series in advance of the Masters, to people to have as many viewpoints uh, from the design of the golf course. We did that with Gil Hans, uh, to the media perspective stories that uh, those of us who cover it want to pursue. And then for you, you know, you got guys in your stable who are among the very best players in the world and a game plan. But I, 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 I want people to understand, because I was lucky enough to spend a few minutes with you last spring in Charlotte, Look, a lot of instructors aspire to play the game, and you were not you know, uncommon to that thought. Um, but you dealt with injury early on, and you had to face mortality as a player at a young age. Um, how challenging was that pivot to go from, I want to get it in the hole to then I got to try to help people get better at the game at a modest level to suddenly finding yourself with the likes of Robert Carlson and he's Slocum where they're, they're literally meat on the table is on the line here. How hard was that pivot? Yeah, it's challenging, but I think if you aspire to play the game, you want to stay around it. And I think the lessons you learn in your frustration are allow you to, to help other people. So you can empathize with players when you've tried to play and I think struggle is probably the best lens with which and perspective to be able to empathize with players. So golf is really, really hard. No matter how good you are, everybody has peaks and troughs. As long as you're trending, golf's going to have highs and lows. And I think if you, I take Nick Saban, for example, he played college football, right? Like he didn't play professionally and arguably he's one of the greatest coaches that's ever played the game, but he had played to a level where he could understand the game, the X's and O's, but then also probably emphasize with the players. And I think to a lesser degree, like when you've struggled a little bit, your skill set's probably more suited to being able to look through things and be a bit more reflective and go, okay, well, why did I struggle? And then that becomes a really good place to come from as a coach because you tend to see things differently. Whereas great players, what makes them great is they're very much 
you know, successful into what they do, but don't necessarily, they're oblivious to their around surroundings. They kind of have to be, right? Like that's what makes a great player. And I think it's very unusual for a great player, like a, a really, really great player to make a fantastic coach, right? So I think that when you've played the game, like to pivot to coaching is you have an urgency because you're a struggling player. So you're always trying to work on your game. So you understand how important like the hard work is, but you've also probably turned up every stone possible to try and figure out how to get better. And that allows you to have more resources and more experience to be able to help a player. So then when you pivot, I think you have the ability to, as a, you know, going into coaching to go, well, okay, well, I had this error. I had this mistake. What was, what did I learn from that? And then how can I share that with other people? And I think that's what kind of sets you up in a pretty good stead. If you, if you take the struggles and some of those things that, don't necessarily break you, but like build character and trying to play mini tours and trying to play golf for a living. That's a really nice place to come and play or, you know, not play, but necessarily arrive from as a coach because you kind of understand the, the what goes on and you understand and appreciate what it takes to play well. And I think that sets you apart as to someone who's just applying. There are plenty of great, amazing coaches and teachers who didn't play but I do think that you have a little bit of a, a skill set that's unique when you've played a little bit and then you get into it. I think that's a nice place to arrive from. Mark, you used the word empathy. You also talked about appreciation. Appreciation is kind of a derivative of gratitude. Um, not all great instructors uh, start out by giving lessons to shitty golfers and i'm not talking about i'm not talking about shitty pros i'm talking about people who really really struggle to, to play golf and you did that does that did that give you a level of gratitude that is persistent in your life now because you know what it's like to get the guy who's trying to break a hundred to shoot 97 yeah i mean look I would say all of the things that I've uh, I have in my life have all come from golf. Like I'm so grateful for the game of golf. It's incredible to think like, you know, started late in England growing up playing golf. I've tried everything else and got sick of getting injured playing rugby and soccer and kind of fell in love with golf, but everything I've accomplished has really been from the game of golf, like an education and then all of the things that my family and my kids are able to do is all because of being around golf and the game of golf and the people I've met and those things. So I'm very appreciative of it, but I would say that when you start from the bottom, like the story is well known. It's pretty funny. I was playing mini tours. I didn't have any to live. I lived in a maintenance shed. And then when I'd stopped playing, I was living there and I was teaching golf lessons in North Alabama on the side of a literally a ski looked like a ski slope. Um, but I would teach anybody and anyone. And I think that when you have to, you know, try and teach people, I've got a funny accent. You're dealing with, you know country people you're trying to figure out ways to get really bad golfers to play the game i do think there's no substitute for being in the trenches i tell everyone this like young coaches if you want to coach teach a lot of really really bad golfers shitty golfers and try and fix them because the best players in the world they have an urgency if they're struggling and you need to fix something the experience you had of knowing how to get somebody to hit a shot it's it's very similar and those experiences help you and i think that you know, if you talk to the old time coaches, a lot of them like spend a lot of time doing things and they kind of earn their way up the apprenticeship sort of route. So I think there's a lot of merit to like having to learn things through self-discovery. And back when I started in, you know, 99, we really didn't have the technology we did now. So it was if you had a video camera, you were high tech. Right. So you had to kind of figure out how to relate to people, do different things it's a challenge. And if someone's really bad, that means you've got to be more creative. And so the more creative you are as a coach, I arguably would say that that helps you become better because you have better strategies. And I always say, look, good coaching is a critical thinking exercise. All we're trying to do is help somebody accomplish their goals. And the more you've kind of had work in the trenches, helping people that suck, uh, that helps you with the better players, right? Because the difference is the better players can actually do what you ask them to do. So you have to make sure you're giving them the right information. So there's no substitute for volume of experience teaching bad golfers, in my opinion. Now, some of my peers might tell me I'm crazy, but uh, I look back on some of that stuff pretty fondly. And 
definitely some characters you meet over the years doing it. Oh, no, no question. Uh, I could go down a rabbit hole with you and, and maybe in, at another time we can do this because I'm interested about your ascent um, in all areas. And I mentioned, you know, he Slocum, that was, you know, that's a, a, a very critical mile marker. And then subsequently Kevin Chappell and Robert Carlson. But because we're doing this in advance of the Masters, I want to focus on three particular individuals um, and let's start with Max, because uh, your relationship with him, uh, I believe, that was fostered right around Wingfoot. Um, and, 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 you know, since then, there have been other pieces added to the team. And I want to talk about that. But he's coming off a very good major championship performance. But here's the problem. It feels like it was a lifetime ago because it was last July. And you know this. You know the narrative with players. Well, he's done this, but he hadn't done that. You know how we are. We'll, we, we'll focus very <laughs> temporarily on all the great, but let's get to what he hadn't done because that's what we like to do uh, is point out, you know, the holes in the resume. What has he gained? Let's, let's focus. Give me some thoughts about 23. What were y'all as a team and you specifically most pleased about with what he did in majors in 2023? Yeah, well, I think the first part is obviously he's got more comfortable playing in those. Everybody knows that they want to try and win majors. That's what identifies you as a great player. So when you got into the sort of upper echelon, let's say top 30 in the world, now there's four tournaments a year, maybe five if you include the players, but there's four tournaments a year plus the, the cup matches like the Ryder Cup and then the President's Cup that every player aspires to play well and they you guys in the media have done a great job of basically that just defines people's careers, which is, you know, not necessarily the best, but that's what it is. Right. And so, you know, everybody wants to win a major. And I think last year was great because it became more comfortable. If you actually look at the volume of majors he's played in relative to people, his age, he hasn't played in that many of them. Absolutely so I true. think that's, that's the one of the things you have to kind of take with a grain of salt. But last year, obviously he played well at um, <clears throat> Royal Liverpool. He kind of got comfortable. I think that that type of golf suits him. Like when the golf course is hard and it's challenging, that's really good for Max. Like he's a, definitely someone that together with Joe, they plot the golf course really, really well. He plays hard golf courses. I think when you know that Par's a good score, the certain players, Rosie's the same. I think that they tend to thrive in that environment and they really embrace the challenge. So I think, in that sense, it's really good. But again, like it's hard to periodize specifically for four tournaments a year, right? And so you're, as a coach, you're trying to do things to get somebody ready and you're trying to figure out, okay, what's the best strategy? Now, when you put a tournament on a pedestal, that becomes difficult. Uh, I think that anytime it's a home game is challenging. I mean, Max is the LA kid, right? Him playing at LACC. That, that's, whether it's like, spoken or unspoken that's still a burden on a kid's shoulder sure. right so that that becomes you setting yourself up for a challenge but i think there's lots of learning that from all of the majors from last year obviously i was really pleased with how we played at royal liverpool and i think that coming into this year you have more experience and understand look you don't necessarily have to be everything focused on playing amazing coming into a major your goal is you just want to be trending and you want to understand that it's another golf tournament how are you preparing? Don't make it like it's something else and really get ready to play. So this year he's actually playing um, next week. He'll be playing at, um, or two weeks, sorry. He'll be playing in Valero in San Antonio. So he's actually playing golf going into it. And that's the first time we've done that since we've worked together. So we're going to play all the weeks before a major this year, just so he's playing golf. So he's not necessarily, you know, he's in the sort of throes of, okay, how am I thinking? And am I am I hitting shots? Am I tournament ready? And then what did I struggle with the last week? Even though they're slightly different courses, I think that puts you in good stead because you're in that playing mindset. It's not like you're getting to a major early and you're sort of, if you like, essentially overly preparing. So for me, I, I think that a lot of the struggles he had last year and then the highs, I think he's learned from that. And I, I think I'm excited for him to get to Augusta and He's kind of doing some really good things at the moment. is isn't necessarily being reflected in the scorecard, but I got a feeling that like that's probably he's probably coming from a nice place. Like if you've been playing great, you're expecting to play great. Your expectations get up. Sometimes that's a hard place to come from as well, right? So 
I'm, I'm excited that he's playing. It's a different strategy. We're trying to play to go into it. Um, so I think he'll, I think he'll play well. And again, he's getting more comfortable in those environments. And what he did at the Ryder Cup in Rome was obviously sensational, arguably the best U.S. player. So I think you can take a lot from that having played. If you can play in the Ryder Cup under that pressure, uh, I always say to my players, and especially Max, look, what you did at the Ryder Cup is incredible. Just imagine a golf tournament, 72 holes of that. So I just need you to do a little bit of that on every hole through a tournament. And now the compounding of that probably going to lead to some really good stuff. Mark, that you, the Ryder Cup for a rookie on the road is like being in a riptide wearing slacks. And for whatever reason, and he did it really, and I know it was at home, he played very, very well and, and responded to the environment of the President's Cup in Charlotte as well. So his indoctrination, it's like, holy cow, this guy, he likes it. He embraces it. But specifically one moment, his singles match, and it wasn't about, you know, his launch angle or club path. It was a processing moment with him and Joe. What to do short of the green on 18. Look, that one little sliver of hope the, the United States had was resting on his shoulders. How can a processing moment of decision-making kind of amplify progress of a player in terms of where he's going in his career? What, what, is that, what are the residual positive effects of what happened on that 18th green and just short of it for you? Well, I think, look, that's the ultimate adversity, isn't it? Like, he felt like he hit a really good second shot. And he ends up there. And then I think Joe deserves a lot of credit in that situation because yeah. Joe was like, look, you should take an unplayable. You should, you know, I think you can still get this up and down. And I think like having the confidence from your teammate, essentially your caddy to tell you that and your belief in it and then being able to actually do it and execute and then make the part. And it's pretty funny because I, I was standing on the side of the green. I go, said to him after, I said, well, you look, like so calm and he goes well I couldn't feel my legs they were shaking so much so I mean that's good because those are the nerves you're going to get when you're contending in a major championship and if you can embrace that and you can prevail I think that's huge as those as great players I think you're trying to put those in your memory bank and that's like that highlight reel you play to yourself and it's an affirmation that hey look I've done this I'm really really good so to me whenever the struggle is the greatest that the accomplishment is that much more satisfying. And I think it, it, it resides a lot stronger in your mind. So to me, that's huge for him. And I think that's a great launch pad for his, you know, season this year, the majors. And I know that that's something that he can definitely lean on. And I use it a lot with him. Like when he's struggling, I'll go, dude, look what you did at the Ryder Cup. Like explain to me how you do that. Like, Golf is golf. So um, it's tough. Sometimes you want players to have that match play mentality when there's a, if there's always another hole, there's always another chance, right? Sometimes that's tough in stroke play, but he seems to be done great with it. And I think that that moment is definitely something that will, in his career, be something that potentially catapults him. So I'm excited for 2024 20, majors for Max Homer. I, um, I was sitting in the press room before his Masters uh, pre pre-tournament presser and I asked him what does it mean to even be doing this knowing that I would get a, a very thoughtful uh, answer and 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 my what I was driving at Mark was what effect can exterior expectations have on a player because he hadn't done these he hadn't done this before he hadn't done this exercise before he said look maybe before I I would have taken this and gotten wrapped up in it as opposed to saying hey this is fun this is fun, and, and, and yes, me being here means that, that my profile is different from what it used to be. Can exterior expectations be used in an advantageous way from your standpoint? Yeah, I definitely think so. I think, look, you can turn everything into a positive. I always say as a coach, you know, your job is the glass is always half full, and I think sometimes that can become nauseating for the players, but you're always trying to look for an opportunity as a learning moment and something that can and help motivate them and put something in a positive light. And as players, they're not always that way, but I think that's the difference between coaches and players, right? Our job is to pump the player up, so to speak. So, yeah, I think any anything that you can spin, if you like, as a coach and, and turn into something as a positive, I think that's huge. And so... I look at everything, every challenge, like the obstacle is the way, right? That, the, the book, the Ryan Holiday. Great book. I mean, look, 
I think that's one of those things where you, you can see the opportunity in everything if you choose to. And as a coach, that's your job. That's your role is to try and help shape and frame the player as the way they see things and know that they've always got an opportunity. And I think good players just need a chance to play and prove themselves. And a lot of times, they forget that the golf is a game to be played and just they know how to do it. Sometimes they just get in their own way. The uh, Another book by Ryan is Stillness is the Key. Master's yep. Week is different. It's not the, 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 the ability of coaches and others to get inside the ropes. Uh, there, there's not that type of clutter on the tournament practice area, on the golf course itself. So you'd say, well, that's great. That's solitude for the player. But, but you have roles that you play week in and week out. How do you manage that week with Edward, with Colby, with you, with Phil, to balance what you all think he needs to be ready Thursday? A lot of it all comes down to, as a team, is communication. At the end of the day, our goal for all of us is Max, right? Max is our priority. So it's where is he? Where is he in his headspace? What do we think is going to help him best prepare and and put him in the right space so i always say look you you don't want to be practicing at the tournament you want to have done your practice you want to be prepping at the tournament like you said augusta is they've done some amazing things this year the coaches actually have our own area which is incredible um you can't go on the golf course but you can still watch from the outside and and at the end of the day look we know the golf course. We've all been there a lot. You play the golf course strategically. There's a certain way to play it to shoot the lowest score. So it's like, are you able to hit the shots you need to to navigate the golf course? And then beyond that, it's like rest, recovery. Uh, how? You, what's your nutrition? Are you hydrating? You're like, are you doing the necessary prep with Phil on the like on the greens? Do you have a good feel for the speed? Like, can you appreciate how much the putts are going to break? The things that are just a unique to Augusta, and I think. With that, as a team, our job is to just get him ready, like get him in a good mindset so that he on come Thursday when he gets his tea time, he's ready to go. I think one of the things that people don't realize either about Augusta is Augusta really doesn't get like Augusta until the tournament starts. Like the course is firm and fast generally if the weather's good and that thing gets so firm and fast. Like I've had the chance to go and play a few times with players. It's a great experience, but the Masters, Augusta National is nothing like how it plays during the tournament. So again, you, you, after experience of that, you're like, well, this isn't the same golf course on a Monday that it is on a Thursday. And it's certainly nothing like it is on a Saturday or a Sunday. So you, you're trying to understand that, like, let the course come to you, know that, you know, the, it changes the, as the week evolves and the job is to have the player in a good space. So they need as much mental energy as they can have. So like rest, recovery, doing the right things with Edward and Colby, that kind of allows him to be in that space and then just making sure like get away from the golf course. Like don't be there all day, every day. Like your job is to be ready to be in contention on the back nine on Sunday. And that's all we're trying to do is give yourself a chance. So I think with every player, that's what you're trying to do. And as a team, you're unifying together to help the player accomplish that. So it's definitely what are the wants and needs of the player. Um, obviously he'll have played the week before at Valero. So we'll have a bit better sort of sense of where he's at but really it's like monday tuesday wednesday do your work thursday you know enjoy the fact that you're playing augusta national which is surreal virtually the um the playing the golf course and we're focusing on max right now we'll get to colin and, and justin but um what do you think is more important height or flight there yeah that's a great question i'm um, so there's all this adage about you've got to draw the ball, but I don't necessarily think that that's the case. I mean, I, I think you can offer the tee now, like most players, they, you're hitting it a long way. You've got to have, you've got to, it's a, it is way more of a driving golf course as they've lengthened it than people historically given it credit for. I think that statistically look at driving as a big deal. Um, I think that you obviously have to be able to hit the ball quite high in certain areas. I think, I would argue that you have to have a bit more variability. Some holes is going to be more shape and some holes are going to be more trajectory. And it really depends on kind of how it's playing. I think your ability to move the ball and be a shot maker is definitely a benefit. I mean, if you look at Scotty and you look at John Rahm, both of them kind of can move it both ways. Um, they both can hit it really high. They can hit it low and they've got good short games, right? So it's definitely one of those things where I would argue that both would be my response to that. I, I think that hitting it high is, is great. Um, 
to the right holes, but then at the same time, you need to be able to flight some shots in and take some spin off because sometimes the greens are, you know, ridiculously spinny, like the ball will back up on those bent greens. So it tests all your skills. I think if you can drive the ball really, really well, that's a huge advantage around Augusta. Like I, I genuinely think it's tough. If you're hitting shorter irons because you're driving it really well, that, that makes it much easier to get the ball back to the holes because obviously they put them in some really interesting positions and the greens are very undulated. Shorter club, which you can arguably hit higher. You've got some big advantages to the players who potentially are like not quite in that sort of 180 plus ball speed. It's tough for them. Do you, um, do you think that there are, let, let's say if I ask you to identify three to five places that are critical places to know where to miss it, on that golf course, are they easily identifiable? Uh, yeah, and I, I think this is the way I would respond to that is depending on what your skill set is on, like where what are you good at? I mean, yeah, like where's in your short game? Like I think it's horses for courses. You have to develop a strategy. If you have an Achilles heel, you need to make sure that you don't get it exposed to Augusta, or you're going to have problems. So you need to know. You know, is it better for you to miss it in a bunker or versus short sided? Like, what what's the, you know what I mean? Like, sometimes some people struggle with really tight. But some of the pitching at Augusta can be challenging. So very much. You you want to make sure you don't put yourself in that position. You might take it in a bunker, knowing that it might be a harder bunker shot, but it's easier for you than it is for you with a, a tight lie chipping. I think those are some of the things strategically that you can do. I think you put yourself in certain situations. You you're going to have a problem. Like let's say you're going for 13, for example, and you go long and you, you, that chip is a challenge for you. Then you might be someone who's better off laying up with a wedge, even though you hate to do that. But strategically speaking, it may just be that you know that you don't like that. So again, it's like, I think you have to, every golf course, you have to build a plan to unique to you as the player that accentuates your skill set and mitigates your deficits. And nobody really wants to talk about that, but that's what great golf is. Great golf is being very disciplined and knowing what you need to do. And round Augusta, the best thing is you play the same golf course year in, year out. Yes, they make changes, but for the most part, you know if you've got experience from playing on how can you mitigate the risk and you know take advantage of what you do well. The um, you know these three guys that that we're focusing on, um, these are thoughtful people. Um, they're not frivolous people. So is your messaging to Colin Morikawa, and this will be your first major, you know, strategizing and working together, and he's already won two majors. Um, Justin Rose has an exemplary record at Augusta National. Of course, you know, Max is, is making an ascendancy in, in all these areas and all these big events. Is the messaging for you, and you're not afraid to kick somebody in the ass, uh, but you're also unafraid to give them a hug if they need it. Is your message with these three guys pretty similar? Uh, I think, look, they're all different. So you've got to try and figure out, like, what is the the way you frame the narrative for each of them? So they're all going to be very different. And then I would say I interact with them all very differently. So obviously, Colin, I would started with him in October. You're still trying to learn the player a little bit and know, you know, how's the best way to approach it. Obviously he's won two majors. The guy knows what he's doing, right? Like he's if mentally, I'd argue he's fantastic. There isn't anybody better. His resiliency, his self-confidence is, is really good. So I think it's, it's trying to feel out what's the best way to push his button, so to speak, to get him, get him ready. But I think he's pretty self-sufficient. Like he's got a proven pedigree. Rosie's, you know, obviously Augusta is the one that he probably asked him if he wanted to win. That's the one. And he's had his hands on the trophy a couple of times and it slipped away. So that's, you can do some different things with that from a motivational standpoint. You can use his age to his advantage. You can, you can be pretty creative, right? And he's also English and so am I originally. So there's some, so probably uh, R-rated ways to be able to motivate Rosie <laughs> with some sarcasm and other things that uh probably a little bit different. And then Max is again, different altogether. And I kind of have a unique relationship with him and he, he's very reflective and he, the best thing about Max is he's very, very coachable. All my guys are, but like Max is unique in that he's definitely very interested in like Joe's input, my input and Phil Kenyon's input. So I think that that 
that's one of those things is like trying to build a game plan for him that keeps him engaged and motivated and makes him feel like he's ready to go. So that's the fun, fun part about coaching is all the players are different. And honestly, you learn some things from other players that you can give to another player. And I always, always say that to my guys. I'm like, look, when I started working with Rosie, the best part was, look, he's a formal number one in the world. I said to Max, this is a great opportunity for me to look under the hood at one of the best players of his generation. That can only help you because some of the learning from that and some of the wisdom Rosie's got, you know, I can share and use, you know, with other players. So it's like they say, you learn more from your players than they do from you. But it's unique. Like you're tr creating a unique story, narrative frame for each of the players. And, and, and I've got Adam Hadwin as well, obviously, playing in the Masters. So yep. it's one of those things you're, you're trying to – all of them are different. Um, and you've got to try and figure out how to, you know, get them doing what they need to do to the best of their ability. And each of those guys has a unique skill set. And I'll, my job is to try and, you know, make them be able to accentuate what they do well and, and then mitigate, you know, what sometimes can be challenging for them. The For Colin, you mentioned starting in October, you, you know, he immediately jumps out, he wins the Zozo. I know one of the things that he wants to understand better is how to stay healthy. Uh, I'm sure it's disarming to, to, you know, to experience injury at a young age l like he has. Um, in the installation of a game plan with him, as you embark on a first major season with him, what have you learned about him that maybe you didn't know? He's uh, one of those guys. He's very good at planning. He's very organized. If he says he's going to do something, he does it. He's very conscientious about his team. He's got a great, great a uh, group of guys that work with him, the guys at UGP, especially Ryan, um, who's his uh, PT, does a great job. And then with Stephen Sweeney and then Andrew, who's putting coach, and then Andrew Kipper. So he, I think the one thing that really impresses me, Colin, he's very organized, he's very diligent, he's definitely a thinker, wants to understand things. Everything is very calculated. There's, he's not really um, someone that just makes a spontaneous decision. He kind of thinks about it, plans about it very articulate in the way he thinks about things. And I think I can really see like why he's been successful in major championships just because of the way he processes and the way he thinks about things. He's like very proactive. And I think that's something for me as a coach is great because that takes some of the, those things you have to do for some players, but with him, he's ready to go. He's very organized. I think we need to do this. I see it this way, which is, is refreshing. It's great. The um, so this will be his fifth major, uh, fifth Masters start, t forty four, t eighteen, fifth, and a tie for tenth. So it's not that he doesn't understand the Rubik's cube; like he's getting closer to to solving it. Is there anything in those experiences that you guys have talked about that he was particularly either encouraged by, pleased by, that you need to apply again this year? Um, not really. I mean, just other than, look, he's played well there. He yeah. knows he can play play well there. And I think that's the thing. Once you kind of got Augusta figured out, like a fifth and a tenth, like you kind of have an idea of what you need to do around there. And I do think it takes people a while to do that. Um, I think once you know kind of where your opportunities lie based on your game, I think that's a big deal. And there's certain stretches of holes that players probably need to play well. Hey, if these are the holes that my eye fits, I need to play those well. Um, or take advantage of them is probably the right way to say. And I, I think, obviously, that's one of the things going into the week that we'll probably discuss. I'll probably talk to him later on this week. And then, obviously, he's also playing Valero, playing going in. So I think there's some of the things you can kind of game plan for the week before. Some of the shots you know you're going to hit, you probably work on those playing Valero. But, yeah, I mean, I think, look, he has an eye for the course. He likes it. Uh, I think the precision he has with his game, he can take advantage of. And probably to him, he's probably excited about it. So that, I think for me, it's just the fact that he's got form there and he likes the course, that's a big deal. Yeah, you mentioned that, that experience is rewarded there. Um, it's interesting. Historically, it's roughly on average your sixth start that made that, that, that guys win there. The, the, it's gotten a little shorter in the last 10 years with the likes of Rom, Spieth, Scotty. But if you look at the mean average, it's about six. Do you have any theory as to why that is? I just think, like, so I worked with Mike Weir for about four or five years. Yeah. And, and we, I've been out there a couple of times in Weirsy. And it, honestly, like, obviously the golf course has changed a little bit. But it's more like when you listen to him, he plays it so much and knows it so well. 
it's like knowing where you can play from to your point like hey you can play from this little gully here it's actually pretty good to hear like and i think that experience like understanding the course and some guys go and play there a lot right and then some guys don't i think that the number of rounds you have and understanding seeing the course and then seeing how it plays um and obviously it can play differently a lot of different years i think that that you're just building more and more experience so to me there's definitely an advantage to the, the more I would say that's just the fact that it plays differently and they've got more experience and they know where they can play from and more importantly, know where they can't play from. I think that's the part where there's some holes there that can play tricky and you like, okay, I like, need to make sure I'm here. I don't want to get greedy. And then there's some other holes where you have a bit more latitude. And I think it's just experience that allows you to do that. The um, before Tiger won in 2019, I, I, you know, you cull through all this data um, and I asked him because I, I saw this thing and I was like, this is hard to <coughs> fathom. At that time in the century, he was the only guy since 2000 to come from outside the top 10. And this was 2005 after the first round to win. And I asked him, do you have any theory as to why that is? He said, hold on a second, repeat that. And I said, you're the only guy this century that has been outside the top 10 after the first round to come back and win. And he said, I know I, I hadn't heard that. And I have no theory. And I'll be damned if he wasn't the guy in 2019. He was just outside the top 10 after the first round. He came back and won. Do you have any ideas to why that is? Like, cause historically, you think about Augusta. Oh, God, these Sunday charges. It doesn't happen. It hasn't happened for well over 25 years. Yeah, and I think, look, if you were to go back, so like Augusta used to be the way the goal was set up back in the day when it wasn't that long. We're talking 20 plus years ago, you know, pre Zach Johnson winning. I think that was the year when they made it longer. I'm not a great golf historian, but like oh, if I remember grow, okay, growing, okay, so perfect, about 20 years ago. I remember growing up in the UK and like the Masters was great. So we had the European dominance, right? Woosnam, Lyle, Faldo, that sort of whole era and Langham. And I would always watch it and I couldn't believe how many birdies they were. Well, that was because the golf course was gettable. Now, as soon as you've made it longer, it's actually a long golf course now, even when it plays fast for the tournament. I just think it's harder. So I think that's probably why. And as the week goes on, the course gets faster and firmer arguably it probably gets a little bit more challenging. I think that's probably why that is. That would be my intuition. I think if you get, you know, putting is a challenge there anyway, right? Because the greens are so slopey. So that in some way mitigates the amazing putters to a degree just because it's that much more challenging. So to me, it becomes more of if you get a bit of a, a head, it's harder to make that up. That would be my intuition. Now, back when it was shorter and there was, you know, people are hitting short irons into par fives is different, but it's not quite the same now. I mean, 15 is not like you're hitting pitching wedges like Tiger did in 97, right? Different animal. No, you're right. Uh, you know, when you mentioned all those guys and that was, you know, 80s into the into the 90s and that, that rush of Europeans winning, when Woosnam won it, I'll never forget, Mark, I was walking with my dad. Tom Watson was hanging around like he was right in the middle of it. And this is the end and again, I understand 2009, but this was a man in his 40s. He eagled 13 and 15 on Sunday in 1991. I mean, so this is a man in his 40s who was reaching greens. Uh, and it's not that these guys can't. But I, no, I, I agree with you that it's not, you know, the idea of like 30 or 31 on the inward nine. I don't look at that as something that you expect a couple of guys to do every year. I think it's no, a it's really hard. rare thing. It's difficult. Now, the way Scotty Scheffler's playing, I wouldn't <laughs> surprise me. And Tiger's the greatest player to ever play the game, so that never surprised. Like, there's certain people who can do magical things, and John Rahm, great. But like, I just think it's a it's a harder golf course, and the way it's set up, it's set up to be difficult. It's not set up to be easy, and I think that's probably why that happens. Now that that's just my hypothesis. I could be completely wrong, but that's just from being around it. That's what I would say. Like, I I think that. It's just can be really challenging, especially if it gets really firm and fast. Like, again, that's that's the hard play for golfers. Firm and fast, much harder than lighter, rough and soft. But people haven't quite figured that out yet. That's a whole nother discussion. No, I, I if it gets really spicy there, 
I, I think the golf course, look, as a viewer, uh, I think it's spectacular and interesting, but hard. I, I mentioned Justin Rose, and you mentioned he had his hands on it twice, close to it. This will be his 19th Masters start, 14 of 18 starts. He's been in the top 25. That includes 11 of the last 13, second in 2015 and 17. Here's the thing. He's played 68 rounds there, and he has a scoring average under par, 71.79. Good Christ, is that wildly impressive. I mean, that, and, and he's been in the throes of contention a, a bunch of times. He's only missed two cuts. The Ryder Cup last fall. At some point, you go, you know what? This guy's not going to make any more putts in his life. It's just, it's just what happens. And I'll be damned if he didn't make everything, or at least it seemed that way. Um, can that week embolden him for this week coming up? Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, I think when I started with Rosie, one of the things is I think he was a bit frustrated. He hadn't played well for a few years. And the first thing that struck me was like, the guy works really, really hard. He just needed a little bit of clarity and he's a heck of a player and he's the consummate professional. You won't find anyone that is more diligent, like does the right work, like from the gym to mentally to sort of the performance side of things with Jason Goldsmith, you know, with his Charlie, his trainers, Adam Dunn and uh, Justin Buckthorpe, like incredible. He's got a great support team with his wife. And then, you know, he's working with Kenyon. He's become, everyone forgets that Rosie was not a very good putter and he's arguably one of the best putters in the world. So Phil Kenyon is incredible what he does. Um, and then it's, you know, his short game, he's doing some work again with James Ridgett. And his full swing is great. And the Ryder Cup just showed like, as, as Kenyon always says, like quality rises to the top, right? And when someone has to perform like he knows what to do like time and time again he's able to do it and i think he maybe had forgotten that a little bit and obviously winning pebble has been great and last year he played well uh oak hill he actually played okay at the masters too so he can still do it he's prepping for it uh, i'm going to see him after i get back from valera i'm going to see him for a few days probably here or at augusta he's he's ready for it i think his game is in a good sp spot he's got his speed up he's playing well um He's not necessarily scoring very well, but I think I'm looking for him to, you know, do good things. And I always tell him, look, VJ won majors in his 40s. There's no reason you can't do it. So I think he's still got some amazing golf left in. He's doing all the right things. Now, he just needs to stay out of Rosie's way, but that's the same with everybody. The, um, the, the Another thing I want you to theorize on, if you would, why is Augusta National kind to its elders uh, there are no elders really in the U.S. Open. They give you 10 years and tell you, hey, if you want to play in it, you've got to go qualify, which is perfect yeah. for the persona of the U.S. Open. Look, there are elders in the in the Open, and, and some of them historically have had some weeks, but Augusta National, elders show up. I mean, and they, they don't just, you know, make it to the weekend. They're hanging around the deep end of the pool. Why do you think that is? I think it goes back to what we said earlier, like, there's no substitute for experience on that golf course. Yeah. And I think that knowing how to play it and maybe where can you get away with some bad shots and where do you need to focus? And again, what suits your game? I mean, the more rounds you have there, the more data in your brain you've got to be able to navigate it. And I think that's what it's why guys who've got a little older still have experience, still, excuse me, have contended there is because they know that, like, look, people don't know the golf course that well who haven't played it that much. They're probably going to make an error. You can, you know, wisdom is definitely very, very important around that golf course because it can turn around and bite you in the butt really quickly. And that's why I think guys who, you know, either won it before or guys who are older who are in the field who've played there a lot, they're still able to show up because they know when they can take it on and when they can't. They know, you know, Hey, I need to be careful here. This pin, this is not a great pin. I've seen some really big disasters from here and they can, you know, mitigate it and make a par. So the other thing that I would say, August now is par is still a good score. Back in the day when it was a birdie fest, you know, eagles everywhere, different. Now, if you're in a, a pickle, you pars aren't bad. So you know where to take your, take your chances. You know what I mean? So I think that's probably, that would be my intuition as to why that is, just from being there enough to now kind of see that. Yeah, no, I, I, no I, I like that. And I also, look, going back to the same place, and usually a lot of the elders are guys who have won there. 
So, you know, they, they, the, the memories of, of the likes of, of Mickelson and Fred Couples and Bernhard Langer, they're not bad memories. They're some of the best yeah. memories they've ever had in their life. A couple more things before I let you go. Um, Augusta National does everything is, is you know, they are Oz. Um, mowing patterns. When you get around that, first of all, the way that, that, that they mow toward the tees is one thing. The other thing yeah. is, <laughs> which again, you know, they think about everything, chipping. Mark, it can be really, really, those sticky chips, overseeded, dense ryegrass. Um, how do you simulate that other than getting on that, the, the agronomic conditions that you're going to see uh, for your players? How do you prepare them? Yeah, so you can see out here in uh, Birmingham, there's a lot of dormant grass and there's yes. a lot of sa sand on that tee. I always tell everyone, if you can pitch off a sand, you can pitch off of anything. So I'm, I'm a big believer on the more challenging the turf condition is, uh, the more organically you're going to be able to chip off that pretty short green stuff. So I think that like understanding, like you've got to have great ball contact. You've got to be able to control the low point. But like practicing in an environment that's equally uncomfortable, aesthetically way more challenging, that sand doesn't look very nice. But if you can pick it off of that, then uh, you actually get to Augusta, it's pretty easy. So I'm a, I'm a big believer on like, let's make practice harder than play and get comfortable being uncomfortable on really tight lies. And if, if you're not, then you got to figure out another strategy. But the problem is a lot of those greens are elevated. And you're pitching up to them, so you still got to get it up in the air. It's not like you can go to a three wood and bump it. So, again, it's one of those things. It's a skill you have to have. Um, and if you're not particularly adept at it, you got to figure a strategy around it, or figure that you're going to be hitting in some bunkers. So, I mean, it's. But I think that look, as a coach, your job is to be creative. That's kind of the, my route to it. Love it. All right, give me. Uh, I want you to visualize a couple shots. Last thing. Uh, for your players and th these are just hypotheticals so let's say right center of the 11th fairway visualize the shot that you would you know i i really don't care where the pin is on that hole um what yeah, what is the visualization you're, you're, of his second on 11 you're, you're hitting a cut because you can play from the right side by 12 t you get greedy on that hole you you know that left water comes in really really quickly so i always say look it's definitely a par hole you want to be moving the ball left to right so that you, if worst case, you're on the side of that green, like maybe even towards 12 T. But uh, you, you just need to be careful. It's it's a hard hole. Now, some guys are smashing it down there and hitting a short iron. So, you know, everyone's different. But like you're you're favoring something that's moving left to right, probably on the higher side. So it's stopping softly. All right. T shot on 14. I think it's. A quietly m one of the most menacing tee shots on, a, on the golf course uh, with the fairway canting in the opposite direction the way the, the fairway flows. What about the visualization of, of hitting a tee shot on 14? Yeah, it's a great one because obviously that hole's dog-legging left and you're trying to – It depend, honestly, a lot of that depends on where that pin is. But, I mean, you, the left trees is dead. You can't really play out of the left side. You can play from the right side. Even if you're in the right trees, you've got – that right side's a much better angle. So I'm definitely something that's kind of playing down the center of the fairway. If it ends up in the right side, it's fine. You could possibly push it around, but it doesn't make any sense. I mean, you're going to probably short to mid to short iron in there. If you hit one and it's, it's bleeding down the right. And that, again, that goes back to my point. Initially, we talked about driving the ball there. I don't think you have to draw the ball to play Augusta. I think you can hit it pretty straight. You yep. might even can hit, hit it, fade it. Um, I think that, you know, arguably 13 now, but it's longer. But you can still hit a pretty straight shot and get there. Maybe you could turn out a tick, but you don't have to hit a shot that's right to left off the tee at Augusta. Uh, last one, and I tell people, if you go to the tournament, <clears throat> make a point if you cross the fairway on 15, stop in the middle of the crosswalk, and just try to get some perspective of, of what they're doing from the top of the hill. That almost looks like an infinity green. It almost looks <laughs> like an island green because there is no humanity on the back end of it. You have the water no. that's to the left of, of, of 16 there. It's a majestic look, but it is, I'll be damned if you're in the throes of it late on a Sunday and you're on the top of the hill and it's hanging in the balance. 
You've been there. You've been there. You played the golf course. You know what it looks like. Um, just a thought about with it on the line, standing at the top of the hill there. Yeah, I mean, it's a much smaller target than you think it is, right? Like, you think it's, oh, it's great. But the challenging part is the, the front is runs off. <laughs> the back runs off. The only place you can bail out is that right bunker. But the problem is that right bunker is not a very easy up and down, especially if the pin's on the left side of the green because you've got water left too. So I think it's one of those things. You have to be a good number. It's got to be coming in pretty high so it's soft. But it, it's definitely uh, – that's where that's where the longer hitter has a huge advantage. If a long hitter gets it down there a little bit and they're hitting a shorter club, now they are hitting – if they do that off of that downhill lie, which again makes the, the – the distance challenging. I just think it's one of those things where obviously, you know, it's a pivotal point in the tournament. It's hard to lay up there, but guys do it just because if the lie isn't quite right and the number's not quite right, that target's pretty small. And I, I think you, once you play the course, especially when I mean, you're there, you appreciate how good some of the shots are people hit from the top of that flat pot. I mean, if they're going in with a, a sort of longer iron, some guys even going with a hybrid or a, I mean, that's an impressive golf shot when they get the distance right and they get the ball to actually land, especially when the course gets fast. But it's uh, he who dare wins, right? Like it's a par five. The good thing is it's a great hole. It's risk reward. You can get it close to the hole if you hit the green, but man, that target's small. Last thing for you <clears throat> as somebody who, who wanted to play and now you're, you know, universally considered the, one of the best instructors, coaches in the world of among some of the best players in the world, confidence as an instructor. I think confidence is a byproduct of preparation and discipline, not so much talent. How can you as an instructor be confident about your players going into this first major of the year? Oh, I think as a coach, you have to have urgency, right? You're trying to prepare your players. You're trying to make sure they've done the work. You're kind of the squeaky wheel. They get a bit frustrated at times probably because I'm, a bit uh i'm fairly obsessive about things right like but that is attention to detail you want them to do well um i think as a coach your urgency is the same as the players right maybe arguably as much do you 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 want them to play well so you got to make sure that they're doing the right things and i think the confidence yeah 100% if you haven't done the work you generally don't see the results and if you don't see the results you don't see the you don't feel confident. So I think it's this perpetuating cycle. You've got to do the work. You've got to do the hard graft. That creates facts in your practice. Those facts are then in your mind that, hey, I can do this. I've done it. I can do it again. And I think that's, that's that process which is necessary. So, again, you're trying to periodize things so that going into the tournaments, they are feeling confident. They know they can execute the shots. And that's the ability that's going to give them confidence that they stand on the first tee and that they're ready to tackle whatever the course throws. At the end of the day, look, great golf is played knowing when you get on the golf course, you have all of the skills inside your bag of 14 clubs to navigate any situation that you encounter and you want to embrace that and you're ready to take the challenge on. If someone's playing from that mind and that perspective, there's a chance that they're going to play really, really well. But when they're not and they don't embrace that challenge, I think that's when things can become really difficult for players. So that's always my goal going into any tournament, but especially the majors. Mark, I value the time because your time is valuable. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you there. I look forward to it, Gary. Appreciate you, buddy. Be safe. Really appreciate Mark Blackburn's time. And as you heard, you know, the preparation, the game plan for some of these top players, it, it can vary. But there's one thing that is universal. If you haven't done the work, there's no way you're going to be confident that you could possibly contend in a major championship. So with Max Homa and Justin Rose and Colin Morikawa and Adam Hadwin uh, all in the field, he will be busy. His viewpoint of the Masters Tournament from the instructor's standpoint, I appreciate him. Most importantly, appreciate you diving into our Masters Preview Series. We'll see you next time right here on Five Clubs.